Hi, we have seen that structures and objects vibrate permanently due to different types of sources, some of which we have already discussed in the introduction video. In this video we will go into much more details on what are the vibration sources and how to characterize them. So first of all, let's see about the definition of free and false vibration. As we already discussed in the introduction, there are different types of vibrations. The first one is free vibrations, where a short initial excitation causes the motion. So this is the example of a mass that is put in an initial position and then released to vibrate freely. The second example is a shock. For example, by hitting the bell here with a short impulse, the bell starts to vibrate. False vibrations, however, are vibrations where the excitation to the system is continuous. And there can be different types of excitation signals. The first and most simple one is harmonic excitation, so in the form of a sine or a cosine. The second one, more general one, is a periodic force signal, where the signal repeats itself over a period t. And the third type is a random signal, where there is no real structure to the signal. So an example of harmonic ex excitation is rotating machines. So if you have a machine made of a rotor here, which has a certain, always has a certain unbalance, so the center of mass is not exactly at the center of rotation, then you are creating forces when the rotor here vibrates. And these forces are given by this form. So we have m e omega squared times cosine of omega t for the force in the x direction and m e omega squared sine of omega t for the force in the y direction. So the force is a rotating vector which changes direction and when you project on x and y results in cosine and sine excitation, so harmonic excitation. The second example of periodic excitation is when the signal repeats itself and one example is uh, engines. So in engines, you don't have a pure sine or cosine excitation, but because every time you do a full turn here uh, of the crank, you will have the same signal coming back. And so it is a periodic excitation. Random excitation is, however, when there is no repetition in the signal. So it can be turbulent wind, waves in storms, traffic, or earthquakes. We know that structures such as buildings, car, airplanes have natural frequency and what we really want to avoid is that one of these natural frequencies is highly excited by the vibration source. So what we need to know is if in the vibration source there is a major frequency component which matches the resonant frequencies of the structure. This is why we need to get interest into what is the frequency content of these excitations. For one pedestrian walking or running at a regular pace uh, on a footbridge, the excitation is periodic. And actually, if you look at different tables from this book, you see that when the pedestrian is just walking, you will have an activity rate of around 2 Hz. Now, if the pedestrian is running, it's slightly higher, can go up to 3.5 Hz. There's also differences when you have slow walking, fast walking, jogging, fast running, etc. So you see already that we talk about frequency content of the excitation. And actually, if you look at um, the force applied by the two feet when walking, which is represented here by the full line, you see that there is a certain period to it, which in this case is 0 0.5 seconds, because the rate of pacing is 2 Hz. Now, a pedestrian could also be 
jumping and in this case at the same rate you see that the shape of the force is quite different in this case although the period uh, over which it repeats itself is the same so the way to characterize this force is by using that type of formula where f as a function of time is given by a constant plus a sum of sine functions at different frequencies so g here is the static weight of the person alpha i is the fourier co coefficient of the ith harmonic and g alpha i is therefore the fourth amplitude of that harmonic fp is the activity rate so you have a first component at fp and then 2 fp 3 fp 4 fp etc each of these sine functions has a different phase like and you have a total number of n harmonics contributing to uh, this form. This is for example the table with the coefficients for walking for forces applied in the vertical direction, in the forward direction and in the lateral direction. And you see for example that it's mostly for the vertical direction that you will have higher harmonics, so harmonic 1, 2 and 3. Now for running you also see that these coefficients can be higher uh, for the different harmonics. So as the frequency content of excitations is very important, we can actually use some mathematical tools. We will now describe the discrete Fourier transform and the continuous Fourier transform. So if you have um, a signal u of t which is periodic of period t you can always decompose it into a discrete Fourier series of the following form where you see that you have a constant term and then a combination of cosine and sine functions at frequencies which are multiple of a fundamental angular frequency omega zero which is 2 pi over the period note that the sum is here infinite this means that any signal is, can be seen as an infinite sum of these cosines, so here with the fundamental frequency and then multiples of uh, fundamental frequency and the same for sine functions. Now the coefficients a0, an and bn are given by these expressions, so a0 is 2 over t times the integral of ut dt, an involves a cosine of n omega zero and bn a sine of n omega zero. Now you can also change that with using trigonometry into when you have a, a, a sum of cosine and sine you can always write it as a cosine with uh, the frequency and a certain phase where this is the relationship between uh, the different coefficients and the phases. Note that this notation is exactly the same as the one you find in Bachmann for uh, excitation of footbridges by pedestrians. An alternative way to represent the discrete Fourier transform is to use a complex formulation where u of t is given as a function of cn, where cn are complex coefficients. These complex coefficients are, represent uh, the information about the phase and amplitude of each of the components of the Fourier transform because you can show that Cn is An minus Ibn over 2 and you know that these e, An and Bn are linked to the amplitude of the signal Dn here and the phase of the signal. Note also that Cn and C minus N are complex conjugates so that Ut will be real. Let's take some examples. So if the signal is sine of five times the fundamental frequency omega zero, you see that there are five oscillations over one period of the signal that is taken to compute the Fourier transform. So in this case, omega zero is one radians per second. Then this is the expression of the dn. So obviously they are zero except for the fifth one. Now, if you add to the signal uh, different frequencies but with the same phase so you have two times the fundamental 
uh, four times a fundamental and nine times a fundamental with different amplitudes you clearly see here that you have some kind of of two sine waves but plus additional components so you do the discrete Fourier transform you find exactly the amplitudes 1 0 5 and 0 2 of the different components you can also make much more complex signals so this for example here what uh, we call a narrow band signal with complex phases uh, if you look at this here it's very difficult to find out what is the frequency although you can count the main oscillations here which are around 20 in the period and actually if you look at the transform you see that indeed the dn's are predominant around n equal to 20 and then you have some uh, side frequencies but with very low amplitudes you can actually also extract the phases and you see that they are really random so all these signals are, have not the same phase they can have a phase difference between all of them as we just saw discrete Fourier transforms applies to periodic signal but what happens if the signal is for example random and there is no periodicity associated to it Now we know that for a discrete Fourier transform uh, you will have one component at multiples of the frequency at fundamental frequency omega zero. But what happens now if the period tends to infinity so that the signal is actually not periodic anymore then you will see that this difference of frequency delta omega tends to d omega so it tends to zero and the function tends to become continuous. So these type of transform apply to any type of signal that is not periodic, so the period tends to infinity. Also, as we said before, the discrete frequency step tends to uh, d omega and the discrete frequency n omega zero tends to a continuous frequency omega. So uh, if we take the expression of the discrete Fourier transform, we cannot take the limit as t tends to infinity because it would be zero. So we take the limit of t times cn and we integrate from minus t over 2 to plus t over 2, which is actually the same as from 0 to t. But now as t tends to infinity, the integral we go from minus infinity plus infinity to plus infinity. And n omega 0 will be replaced by omega. So we end up with this expression, which is the expression of the continuous Fourier transform of u of t. We know that the continuous Fourier transform is given by the limit when t tends to infinity of tcn, which is given by this expression. We also know that if we use the discrete Fourier transform, u of t is given by this sum. So we are taking the limit when t tends to infinity and replacing cn by cn times t over t. Now, if we rearrange the terms, we see here the limit of c n t which will give us u of omega the e to the power of i n omega zero t leads to uh, e to the power of i omega t because n omega zero tends to omega and we replace the t here at the bottom by 2 pi over omega zero and when t tends to infinity omega zero tends to d omega so we see the appearance of a 1 over 2 pi and so that the continuous Fourier transform is given by this expression and it's inverse by this expression. See the difference? First difference is that in the exponential you have a negative exponent for the continuous Fourier transform and a positive one for, for the inverse transform. Also see the appearance of 1 over 2 pi for the inverse transform. So the Fourier transform here is expressed in terms of the angular frequency omega but by using the relationship omega is 2 pi f so that d omega is 2 pi df we can also write it in the frequency domain and express it in hertz. Note that if you look then at the inverse Fourier transform and then use um, the unit of hertz 
the term 1 over 2 pi disappears. So when you are using frequencies in hertz, the direct and inverse do not have this 1 over 2 pi term in difference in term. They only have the difference in the sign of the exponent. Let's now have a look at a few continuous Fourier transform of typical signals used in structural dynamics. So these are typical examples of continuous Fourier transform. If you take the Fourier transform of a constant function, you will get a direct. If you take the Fourier transform of a direct function, you will have a constant. The Fourier transform of a sine or a cosine is two direct function at minus F0 and plus F0. And if you take the Fourier transform of a direct com, so a set of direct functions separated by a period t, then you will have another Fourier, uh, another direct comp where the spacing in the frequency domain is 1 over t. Let's have a closer look at, for example, the Fourier transform of a rectangular box function, which is expressed at this. So this is 0 below minus a and 0 above minus a, uh, above plus a, and here the value of the function is 1 between these two values. So if we take the expression of the continuous Fourier transform and express it in hertz, this integral reduces from minus a to plus a, then we look at the primitive, this is what we get, and we end up with this expression, which can be expressed as 2 times the sine of 2 pi f a over 2 pi f. Now this function is actually 2 a times the sinc function of 2 f a, where the sinc function is defined as sine of pi x over pi x. This is represented here, so you see that this function is maximum at zero, and then it has a certain number of oscillations and what we call the main lobe here is this one and extends from 0 to 1. Now if we take two different rectangles of different width you see that then this first lobe will extend uh, differently. So for a long rectangle you see that the first lobe is quite narrow but as you shorten the rectangle the first lobe becomes wider. Now this rectangular function can be seen as the impulse excitation of a system. So what you see is that if the time during which you are hitting the object is becoming smaller and smaller, you will have a wider first lobe of excitation. But in fact, if you want to compare impulses with the same energy, you have to have f delta t, which is equal, which means that the area of these rectangles must be the same. This is what is done here. So when the rectangle becomes narrower, the force, the amplitude of the force is higher. So here we have three different rectangles of same area. This extends much further here, but of different impact length. And you see that, of course, they have the same amplitude at, at zero now because this area is the same. But you see that as the time of impact is smaller, the frequency band that is excited becomes much more wider. And at the limit, when this tends to a direct function, the true Fourier transform tends to a constant. This is what we just saw before. Now let's discuss the case of Duhamel's integral with harmonic excitation. So we are assuming that the excitation and the response are harmonic, and we are applying Duhamel's integral for the response x of t, which is the convolution of the excitation force, here harmonic, and the impulse response. Now this convolution we know that we can invert and convolute h with f instead of f with h. And the, we take out of the integral, which is over 2, the time t, and we end up with this expression, which is first we have the force, the harmonic force here, and then here we have this, which is actually the continuous Fourier transform of h of t, so h of omega. Now, if we rearrange the terms, we see that h omega is x of omega, 
divided by f of omega. And this is the definition of the transfer function of the system. Therefore, this shows that the Fourier transform of the impulse response is equal to the transfer function. For a single degree of freedom, for example, we will have h of t given by this form, and it can be shown that the Fourier transform of that is given by this expression, which is the Fourier transform of a single degree of freedom system. An, an important theorem when dealing with Fourier transform is the convolution theorem, which states that if you do a convolution in the time domain, it will correspond to a multiplication in the frequency domain. And if you do a multiplication in the time domain, it will correspond to a convolution in the frequency domain. The continuous Fourier transforms applies to continuous signals. But in reality, when you record a signal using accelerometers and a data acquisition system, you actually acquire sample signals. So what happens to the Fourier transforms when your signals are sampled in time? In practice, when you record vibration signals, they are recorded at discrete time steps delta t, which is called sampling. And this can be seen as multiplying the continuous function by a Dirac comb with pacing delta t as shown below. So as we just saw, the convolution theorem tells us that if we multiply two signals in the time domain, in order to get the Fourier transform of the result, we have to do a convolution of the Fourier transform of each signal. So let's take an example. We have a sine function and the Fourier transform, the continuous Fourier transform, is two Dirac functions at frequencies f0 and minus f0. Then the Dirac comb, the Fourier transform of a Dirac comb, as we saw before, is in the frequency domain another Dirac comb with spacing 1 over delta t. So graphically, we have the sine function and its continuous Fourier transform and the direct pulses, which are transformed to a set of direct pulses based by 1 over delta t. Now, if the frequency of this sign is smaller than the frequency of sampling divided by 2, when we convolute these two signals, you see that it leads to a repetition of the Fourier transform with a spacing 1 over delta t. Now this is a periodic function and only one part is useful because these are all repetitions and the part here on the left is a mirror of the part on the right so we only have a useful part up to the frequency fs over 2. Now in the case that f0 is greater than fs over 2 then you see that the convolution of these two direct functions with the direct comb spaced by 1 over delta t will lead to some overlapping. So you have here the initial minus f0 plus f0 and the other one and you see that part of the, this uh, spectrum is copied at a lower frequency. And so it seems like you have a frequency at fs minus f0 but it's actually due to the too low sampling rate that you are using. So what we saw, if you apply a continuous Fourier transform to sample signal, you will have a periodic function of the frequency of which only one part is useful. And actually in practice, you are not applying continuous Fourier transform, but discrete Fourier transform. So the basic principle is that you take your sample signals and then you compute that Fourier transform, the discrete one at n regular frequency intervals, which are given by 2 pi over so the frequency spacing is given by 2 pi over t. So your frequency resolution will depend on the length of the signal that you measure. And you will have a resulting frequency band of measurement from 0 to f max, where f max is now equal to 1 over delta t, so the sampling frequency, the, the, the sampling time. And in the end, only one part of this spectrum will be use, useful, so only half of the spectrum will be useful, so you will be able to have the Fourier transform up to fs over 2. 
So just a few remarks. So if you take the discrete Fourier transform on a time interval from 0 to t, this is, can be seen as implicitly assuming that the signal has a period t. This discrete Fourier transform, therefore, is only going to be exact if the period the, the, the signal is periodic of period t or if the signal is zero before t equal to zero and after t equal t. Also, due to the periodicity of the Fourier transform of a sample signal, the DFT needs to be computed only at n frequencies and the useful part is only contains only n divided by two points and ranges from zero to fs over two. In practice, these discrete Fourier transforms of sample signals are computing using an algorithm called the fast Fourier transform. Now, if you want to compute the discrete Fourier transform of sample signal in MATLAB or Octave, um, this is what you have to do. So the definition is given here. And actually, if you have a sample signal at n regular time intervals, this integral is replaced by a sum of delta t u expressed at the different times times e to the power of minus i n omega 0 j, so this is the discrete frequencies, times uh, delta t. Now this can be re-expressed as putting delta t outside, so delta t over t, which leads to 1 over n, times this expression. And this expression is exactly the definition of a, a Fourier transform in MATLAB of octave, so you can just use 1 over n times the function fft of u. For the continuous Fourier transform, we know that this is the limit when t tends to infinity of t c n, so if we replace, we find now that this continuous Fourier transform will given, be given by delta t times fft of u, where fft is the function in MATLAB or Octave. And this function will converge to the continuous Fourier transform only if, of course, t is quite large, because we are taking the limit when t tends to infinity, and if the sampling time delta t is small. In practice, if you want to characterize the frequency content of a measured signal, you need to apply the discrete Fourier transform to it. Let's have a look at a few practical examples of this application in everyday life for civil and mechanical engineers. The first example is the discrete Fourier transform of an impulse response. So we take a one degree of freedom system with k, m, and b values, and we can plot the impulse response. This impulse response is sampled at this time uh, interval, so that the sampling frequency is 6.519 Hz. We take n equal to 4096 sample points, so that the total time is 628 seconds, and the frequency resolution is therefore about 1.5 millihertz. When we perform the Fourier transform, we see first this mirror effect. So we have the Fourier transform M, its mirror. The maximum frequency is Fs, so the 6.5 Hertz. And we have a useful spectrum that goes up to Fs over 2. And in that frequency band, from 0 to Fs over 2, you see that you have an excellent approximation of the transfer function of this one degree of freedom system with the natural frequency here around 0 0.15 Hertz. If we take the same system and we now put a random input for, input for signal, we use uh, a slightly different uh, sampling time, so we now extend to 65 Hertz the sampling frequency. We take more points and so that the total time is 691 seconds and we have again a resolution in frequency in the order of 1.4 millihertz in this case. We look at the output displacement signal and we do the Fourier transform. What you will see is that then we are able to look at the frequency content of this signal up to uh, high frequencies, but we 
here focus from 0 to 1 Hz, where we see clearly that around the natural frequency of the system, there is an amplification of uh, the response around the resonance at 0 0.159 Hz. Another example is uh, this earthquake. So remember, this is the Santa Cruz earthquake we already discussed. So in this case, the signal was recorded with a delta T of 5 milliseconds. So we can then have a useful, uh, the, uh, you, we have a sampling frequency of 200 Hertz. We take 10,000 points. So total time is 50 seconds and the frequency resolution is 0 0.02 Hertz. And the useful part of the spectrum is up to Fs over 2, so 100 Hertz. And when looking at this, we clearly see that this earthquake has its main excitation components in that frequency range, so in the low frequency range, below 10 Hertz. We can also get an idea of the frequencies of excitations uh, of an engine attached to a car. And for this, the first step is to measure with accelerometers what are the uh, vibrations of this engine. The best part about using Mide's Slamstick data loggers is how quick and easy setup becomes. There are no wires, it's light enough to use double-sided tape for mounting, and it begins recording with just the push of a button. example, we're going to analyze the vibration data from the car engine. This is just going to be a quick overview, and so again, I encourage you to please download the Slamstick Lab on the website, as well as these example recording files if you want to dive a little deeper into the data. So I'm going to look at the data from the 25G Slamstick X unit. After it's finished loading, it's going to plot a moving envelope of the whole vibration profile. Uh, you can see when the I turned on the car engine, it's idling here, and then I rev the engine, let it idle before turning off, and you can even see actually when I get out of the car. So once your signal is recorded, you can look at specific um, parts of it, and here we are going to look at the idle data. So the delta T here is 50 microseconds, so we can go at a sampling rate of 20 kilohertz, we have uh, a, a total length of five seconds, so a resolution in the frequency of 0 0.2 hertz. And if we zoom on this idle data, so when the engine is running but not uh, accelerating or decelerating, this is what we get. And by performing the Fourier transform and uh, focusing in the low frequency band, we see that we have a few peaks in the frequency band, the main one being around 30 Hertz. So as in the case of the car engine, it's possible using just a smartphone and a dedicated app to use the accelerometers inside the phone to measure the main frequencies of vibration signals, as we will demonstrate now. So the most common device to measure vibrations is uh, accelerometers. And nowadays you have accelerometers in smartphones. And so now what I'm going to demonstrate is that with this simple smartphone, it's possible to measure the vibration of an object and have an ID of the resonant frequency. So the goal here is to determine what is the natural frequency of this empty ice cream box. So a first idea of this natural frequency uh, can be obtained by knocking on the box and by hearing the sound. But of course, if you're not a musician, you don't really have an idea of what uh, is the frequency of that sound that we hear. So what I can do is then use my smartphone with a specific app and I'm going to put the smartphone on the box and it's going to measure the vibrations and do a fast Fourier transform to extract the frequencies. Let's look at that. 
So the application is called uh, accelerometer meter and I'm now going to put it uh, on the box and what you see is that um, I have different options and the first one I'm going to look at is graph and so graph allows you to see the time domain signals of the three accelerometers. So if I'm now knocking on the box you clearly see the impulse response of this box. Now I can go then to the, the Fourier domain by looking at spectrum. So if I go back and I click on spectrum and continue, now it's going to do the, the fast Fourier transform in real time. So now there is, it's just measuring the ambient vibration, but since it's on the box, if I knock here, you see clearly now some peaks appearing here uh, at the left. So I'm measuring here uh, X, Y and Z. If I want to focus only on Z, which is the out of plane direction, you see clearly this peak here that is uh, around 25, 30 Hertz. And there are several natural frequencies and depending on where I knock on the box, some are more or less present. So as you see, this is a very handy tool to get an idea of the natural frequency of an object with your simple smartphone. In summary, structures vibrate to different types of sources. In order to make sure that these sources will not create a resonance in the structure, it is very important to assess the frequency content of these excitations. The tool used for that is the Fourier transform, and in particular when measuring with modern data acquisition system, you are going to apply the discrete Fourier transform to sample signals. So by applying this Fourier transform to the measured signal, you can assess what frequencies will be excited and therefore you can assess in which frequency band you need to compute the response of your structure to make sure that you are not exceeding the required vibration level. So this leads us to the problem of design and what do you do if these levels are too high or not high enough in some applications. This is for the next videos.